Although artificial intelligence, or AI, has been around for some time, it is now more embedded in systems. The effects could be profound, changing the workplace by requiring a set of specific skills, including technological expertise, adaptability, and critical thinking. In a recent seminar organized by HKMU's Office for Advancement of Learning and Teaching, or ALTO, Dr. Sean McNinn, director of the Center for Education Innovation at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, discusses the importance of preparing students for the future of work, particularly in light of the increasing use of AI. He also looks at the impact of ChatGPT, a generative AI tool on the workforce, and suggests that skills and jobs relating to programming or writing may see the most effects. So I'm gonna basically break this talk into three different contexts. The first two contexts I'll, I'll go through fairly quickly, and the last one we'll be focusing on teaching and learning. Now the first context is future of work. And I, I think I, this is a good one to begin with because it's quite important because after all, this is what we're doing. We're preparing students for the future of work. And recently, Professor George Siemens wrote in his newsletter that AI is the next big thing to change everything. This time he believes it. And the reason is, is because it impacts across systems. And I think that's an important quote to begin with because uh, when we think about AI now, AI has been around for a while, but it's increasingly becoming more embedded into systems. So it's not like MOOCs, it's not like other technologies that have made promises to transform higher education. They have had an impact and they're worthwhile endeavors, but AI seems to be a little bit different because it's embedded in systems. Before we get to ChatGPT, though, which is more recent, we need to think about the future of work and students and the importance of uh, education and preparing them. A lot of organizations from uh, OECD, Web Forum, UNESCO, have all talked about the future of work. And usually they say we need to prepare our students in various skill sets. Usually they revolve around technological skills, social skills, and higher cognitive skills, critical thinking, creativity, and so on. If we look at McKinsey and Global Institute, they've come out with what they call distinct elements of talent, and they've identified 56, and they've categorized them into four areas. Cognitive, interpersonal, self-leadership, and digital. And these also raise uh, or identify particular skills that are gonna become increasingly important for future of work. If we look at AI, you could probably cut down to these two categories, they will probably become increasingly important in the area of, of technology. Uh, one of the reasons if, if we look at cognitive, for example, you need to understand bias, uh, you need to have the ability to adjust and adaptability. Adaptability is becoming increasingly important. Just think about not just the last few years with uh, COVID and so on, where we've had to be adaptable, but the working world is changing. Uh, things are becoming more transdisciplinary. So adaptability is increasingly becoming important. In fact, their report suggests that students who show high level of adaptability will probably be more employable. So it's one of the key leading skill sets that will be needed in the future. How do you teach adaptability? That's a whole other uh, question. Um, it's a very difficult thing, but you don't teach it through tests, you can teach it through experiences. That's one way of having students learn adaptability. More recently, the World Economic Forum released what they call the Education 4.0, a taxonomy for the future of learning. And what I like about this is they've identified key skill sets. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to connect higher education or education in general, primary, secondary, and so on, with employers. They're trying to come up with a language and a framework that both sectors can talk to each other. And you can see knowledge is still there, disciplinary knowledge at the next level, and then discipline-specific knowledge is still there. It's still important. Uh, but all skill sets are also there. What I like about this is they've broken it down into interpersonal, intrapersonal, and extrapersonal. And extrapersonal is an interesting one because we talk about societal uh, skill sets. 
awareness of society, civic responsibility, environmental stewardship, and so on. Since ChatGPT has come out, studies have started to happen. People are looking into this. What kind of impact will generative AI have on uh, workforces and uh, the work industry? Uh, and this is a more recent study, March 23rd, has identified that um, the importance of science and critical thinking are still there because generative AI or AI tools are still not quite good with critical thinking. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the, uh, later on. Uh, however, skills and jobs that require uh, or rely mostly on programming or writing skills might have a large impact. Now, I think that some of this seems obvious, but we do need to do research just to confirm it. And, and you'll probably see more research uh, indicating this. Uh, Goldman Sachs recently came out with a, a paper talking about the impact of ChatGPT on the world industries. And they've uh, placed Hong Kong at the top of the list as receiving uh, probably having the most impact by generative AI. And this is likely because of the nature of jobs that we have in Hong Kong. Uh, for example, I, I, I know some lawyers who have talked about uh, there is less of a need for junior lawyers or a large number of junior lawyers because generative AI can do a lot of the work. They still need to check the work, but um, they're seeing now that they could outsource some of the work that a junior lawyer would do that a generative AI can do. So this brings me to the second context, and that's the AI landscape and literacy. If we look not too far in the past, we can see that uh, there is a growing number of companies that are really leading this, leading the development of generative AI tools. OpenAI is one of them, of course, uh, but that's text to text, uh, and, but they also have text to image. But you have Midjourney, you have Google's answer uh, to ChatGPT, and also Microsoft's Bing. So a lot of what is developing in this area is coming from the commercial world. A little less than two years ago, we can see that the main area for the generative AI market is the United States, with, with the fastest growth coming from Asia, particularly China, and uh, a little bit in Australia. So this is something to consider when we start talking about ethics because we need to ask ourselves, well, who is designing these tools and how are they collecting the data sets and what bias lies in the data sets and how it's trained. Even if it's unintentional, uh, it will still be influenced by the cultures, uh, not just the national culture, but also the commercial culture as well. Um, just think about your user experience with Bing, Bard, and ChatGPT. It's different. The content policy is probably different for each one. Mid-journey, the content policy is different as well. And they're the ones who are determining what should be placed in the content policy. More recently, the European Union, the Council of the European Union, released a paper, ChatGPT in the public sector, overhyped or overlooked, and they point out that ChatGPT itself is mostly run by tech leaders. Uh, again, whether it's intentional or unintentional, that's irrelevant, but they will have a particular worldview in how they design these tools. And we can also see yesterday in their report that U.S. still dominates the uh, language learning models and with China having 50% and other countries having 13%. Uh, and commercial entities are still leading the development of these tools. And um, academic institutions, 13%. We are seeing tools coming out rapidly. Uh, this is one that's been advertised, and, I, and I'm really excited to hear our speakers uh, today in Microsoft to talk a little bit about this. I do think that ChatGPT uh, uh, is just the tip of the iceberg in, in the sense that uh, once Microsoft Copilot is released, it will show a whole new level in how we interact and uh, how we can teach and how we can learn and how we produce content uh, with the use of tools like Copilot. And I'll talk a little bit a little bit about this, but I'll leave it to Microsoft because they're the experts in this area. But I do say things that I'm hearing about, for example, with Teams, for the fact that it will be able to transcribe your meetings, it will be able to uh, if I'm in a meeting in Teams and I come 15 minutes late, I can say, 
hey, what did I miss? And it will tell me. Um, and it will also take minutes of the meeting for me and categorize it across themes. This is very promising, not just on the productivity side from a non-academic st stance, but from a teaching learning purpose stance, I can really see the potential in how we can have students do different activities via Teams and make use of the speech to text AI generation for different learning activities. So it's quite exciting. But we need to think about, as these tools come up, as I was hinting at a little bit, whether it's intentional or unintentional, when people are designing these tools, culture is embedded into the design, it's embedded into the production, it's embedded into the adoption and the use. And in some cases, we need to be concerned about how perhaps AI, if it's used for malicious intent, could propagate misinformation and disinformation. Uh, or if bias is in the uh, data set, for example, we need to consider how misinformation is being spread. I read an article from Harvard Business Review where they were talking about a little bit about the worry that this argument that it's good that we can now personalize our experience with data and information, but there is a possibility that that will also create echo chambers. So if I'm stuck in an AI where it's personalizing everything that I want to know and I want to learn, there is that possibility that uh, I will get stuck in my own echo chamber and misinformation I might then propagate when I share what I learned through AI and it might misinform other people because it's a very narrow worldview. So that's, that's one example. Uh, and of course, uh, this is a quote from a newspaper. Uh, I think this is quite true. The majority of us, including the creators and trainers of AI, will not even know when we are incorrect. And thus, unintentionally, technology may spread ideas that distort reality. And this is coming back to what I was saying about the personalized experience through AI. It could distort my uh, understanding of reality uh, unintentionally. Closer to home, if we look at things like anti-discrimination laws um, within Hong Kong, uh, this is a quote from a more recent article, uh, while Hong Kong's existing four anti-discrimination laws specify the scope of application or discriminatory behavior to natural or legal persons, they do not address the new forms of discrimination that may arise from technological development, leaving room for established biases in data to be amplified in the use of artificial intelligence. So this is something that's relevant for law, obviously, but it's also relevant for education when we start thinking about adopting it. So that leads to other bias, bias built into the data, but also AI-induced bias. So as teachers, as adopters of the technology, we should or we could ask us various questions. I just put a few here to ask, uh, how does generative AI reveal the world to us? Right? What kind of culture does it embed and promote? How does it affect a relationship with other human beings? How does it shape our understanding? Uh, of ourselves and our role in the world, and how does it challenge or support our values and goals? Uh, some people, as you probably know, have already said we need to put a pause on the development. Uh, and while that's quite a just uh, goal, uh, I think it's a very difficult one uh, to do. Uh, Pandora's box is open. Uh, and we have a bit of a prisoner's dilemma, let's say. If someone does stop, well, that doesn't mean the other person's going to stop. So uh, it's very difficult to pause in that sense. So that's me wrapping up context too, and just giving a little bit about things about AI literacy and things that we need to think about, particularly on who's designing the tools, who's regulating the content policy, and what kind of bias might appear as a result in the design, but also in the use. I'd like to focus more on context three, and that's teaching and learning. I think that's why most of us are here. What does this mean for teaching and learning? I recently attended an event with Professor Locken, and uh, she talked a little bit about AI readiness. And I think this is actually, perhaps for our perspective, a better term than AI uh, literacy. Because AI literacy is looking more at the technical aspect of how it works and what it can do. And, uh, um, the user experience. AI readiness is more about uh, the contextualized way of using these tools 
and helping people understand the impact of AI through its use. And also preparing teachers to be able to make the right choices for when to use AI for teaching and learning purposes. And we need to remind ourselves that AI isn't a person. You hear a lot of, I, myself included, when you get excited about it, you talk about AI as if it's another person, if it's, if it, almost as if it has a consciousness. We need to be careful about overestimating what it is. It is still a tool. It's still just doing simple mechanics where it's predicting texts based on the, how it's been trained. That's an important point. And we need to remind ourselves it is going to be embedded into all systems. And as George Seaman says, this does change everything in the sense that we need to rethink some learning theories. Think about communities of inquiry, how that works. Well, now we have an AI agent that operates in a human-like way. We engage with AI agents. We have dialogue with AI agents. So in a sense, they become an agent themselves within a community of inquiry. How does that change the community? And uh, how does it change scaffolding and learning? There was some talk already about uh, using AI as tutors. How do we make use of that to scaffold learning? What about study skills? What about creativity? So this will change uh, a lot of things. And it already is. Some studies are starting to come out. For example, this recent study took a look at how behavior is changed when uh, we introduce ChatGPT into the writing system. In the gray, you, we can see the normal process. A large amount of time is spent brainstorming. The majority of time is spent uh, writing the draft, and then editing is taking less time. Introduce ChatGPT, more time is spent on editing, less on the first draft. Now this makes sense, but it could have implications on how we teach writing, how we think about the writing process. Uh, it could open up the possibility that we focus more on the content because we can generate the first draft so quickly. Is that necessarily a bad thing? I don't know. I mean, I think it's still too early. It's a lot of what we're talking about is still speculative, but it does change the process. And the same study also finds that if ChatGPT is especially helpful to those with poor writing and communication skills relative to other skills, it could have major labor market implications by expanding the available occupational choices and raising the earnings of individuals with strong idea generation skills, but who struggle to effectively get those ideas on paper. So in that sense, it might just empower those who normally struggle with communication, but they're very good at problem solving. They're very good at ideas. But in another sense, while it might be improving their chances, those who are also good at communication and problem solving and ideation give them more of an advantage as well. So there's a potential of widening of a gap. Other studies are coming out that are saying similar things and the impact it can have on education. Sometimes, though, I do wonder if we are being too focused on ChatGPT. Uh, as I mentioned, Copilot's coming out. Uh, there are other tools that are, are coming out every day. Uh, Bing is a useful tool that's embedded into uh, Edge, and it's becoming increasingly embedded into all of the other Microsoft products. Each one has slightly a different function. Each one will have different affordances. And then there's also talk about detecting use. And I wonder if this is a race we can even win, to be honest. Or are we just a sloth trying to catch up with this fast-moving technology? Because it's going to consistently change. And if that's our goal, just to race the technology, then I suspect we're doing our students a disservice. Because we're focusing on the wrong things. And a lot of the tools that are out there actually are uh, reporting a lot of false positives. So in that sense, they're not even that reliable at the moment. Uh, our university has done a little bit of in-house testing. We turn it in, and we're finding it does generate a lot of false positives. Uh, so we're not recommending that teachers rely solely on these tools to capture cheating. Instead, we're trying to look at assessment design and getting teachers ready 
to rethink both their teaching and learning practices, but also their assessment design. And there are various ways of doing this. There shouldn't be just one size fits all. It, a lot depends on the context of the course and scalability as well. And um, I'll talk about a couple in depth in a moment, but uh, one thing that we are practicing or talking about is uh, to appease faculty members who are still concerned about, well, how do I know my students really have retained that knowledge and have an understanding of the knowledge that they're learning in my class? We should just go back to closed book examinations. Now, in some courses, that might be the best option. But some, it still might be a step backwards. You could, if you're really concerned about testing their knowledge, flipping that around, possibly, where you give them a midterm and a series of small stakes quizzes where they take to test their knowledge and identify the gaps in their knowledge. And then after the midterm, have them do a design project or a problem-based project where they apply that knowledge. So then at least you're still testing them in a closed book session to see whether or not they truly are learning, but you're doing that first. And then you move on to the application sense. Now again, I wouldn't recommend this as a one-size-fits-all model, but it is one possibility. And there are other possibilities that we can consider. I think what we need to really think about is that the emerging properties are starting to occur uh, within the education sector. And we need to think of this as a complex system. Complex systems are systems that have parts that affect each other uh, and the whole system in different ways. So for instance, just think about changing teaching methods when you incorporate ChatGPT. That will affect the system on different levels. So coming back to AI readiness, as I mentioned, it's about helping people to understand enough about AI and make good decisions in procuring and using AI to meet their particular needs. UNESCO has released a very useful guide to give some suggestions and areas that uh, higher education institutions should think about uh, with the new AI-driven uh, world. Uh, they've identified, on one hand, a very simple flowchart to help you think about, should I use it, to another flowchart that suggests different roles that AI could take in a teaching and learning process, and also to help teachers design their courses so it can take up those roles. Now, this suggests that if AI has a role in the teaching and learning process, then you need methods to go along with those roles. So a role suggests that there's a goal, something that needs to be done. So you need different methods for that role to be able to accomplish that goal. We can think about the use of AI in similar ways that we ask ourselves about the human-to-human -human relationships. How are we influenced by issues such as trust, power, identity, belonging, difference, affection, and so on? These are the same kind of questions we ask in human-to-human -human interactions. With AI, we need to expand our notion of what is defined as a social practice in which learning interactions take place. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier in the sense that um, AI is in systems, it's in complex systems. Education is a complex system, whether at the classroom level, at the program level, or at the institutional level, it will be embedded in some way. And it will be part of our social practice, our interactions within that system. So George Siemens and a group of other professors have written uh, a paper, the, the citation is there in the slide. It's a very, very good paper and I recommend a lot of faculty members to read this. It's dense, it needs a couple of reading, but uh, it, it is quite useful to give you a, a perspective on how we might look at uh, the impact of AI in higher education. And they put together, academics love these models and these kind of diagrams. Once you can make sense of it, it is quite helpful. So I'll try to explain some of what uh, they talk about. First, we need to think about the cognitive perspectives. And that's creativity, and that's also self-regulation and hybrid cognition. Because now it's no longer just humans uh, constructing knowledge, it's humans and AI constructing knowledge together. So there's a hybridity occurring. So when we're thinking about this in our teaching and learning practices, in our curriculum design, we need to emphasize both human cognition, metacognition, and its behavior with AI. So in this view, AI is a teammate 
or a scaffold in a human artificial cognitive system. If we look at the humanistic perspectives, humans are still better at many things, and we need to keep humans in the loop. We need to promote the capabilities that differentiate humans from machines, but at the same time we need to acknowledge that AI shapes human practices, it asserts that human agency to shape AI for human values is central. How we use AI, we're still keeping humans at the center, basically. But we also have to acknowledge that it does influence how we work. But this is where creativity, complex problem solving, and critical analysis and decision making come into play. We still need humans in the loop. Social perspectives, this is coming back to what I mentioned earlier. We're less concerned with how AI affects individual cognitive and behavior in this sense, but more how it affects society and social action on the whole. In their paper, they present a social cultural focus on how AI mediates shared meaning making. So collaboration, basically, and how AI is part of that collaborative process. So we need to think about this network effect. Now AI agents are nodes within our social learning practices. We also need to remind ourselves, and this is Locken again, but I've adapted it a little bit, uh, that humans are still better at what we call meta-intelligence. One is meta-emotion. We're able to be self-aware and develop a finely sensitive awareness of how we feel and how others feel. AI is still not able to do that. Meta-contextual awareness. We have the ability to develop an awareness of our interactions with the world, including our social interactions, and our physical and our mental abilities as we move through different settings and different interactions and different experiences. Every time we experience something new, it could create new knowledge. Data sets can't update that quickly. So this is something that we need to think about. Metacognition, thinking about how we think, being aware how we think. Meta-knowledge, ontology in a sense, knowing one's own knowledge and understanding of a particular subject or domain. This involves being aware of what you know and what you don't know about a topic as well as how that knowledge is organized and connected. One of the things I always tell my students is we don't always know what we don't know. And, and we need to be aware of that as we're learning. Whereas if you interact with ChatGPT, it seems to be the smartest thing in the world and it's very confident in its answers. So in the context of meta-intelligence and in the context of social interaction, social learning, I think it's important we start to think about dialogic learning experience and how we learn through dialogue and conversations both with students and with teachers and, and other members of society in order to learn. Uh, I'm experimenting myself uh, just within the institution just to see what ways we might uh, recommend teaching and learning design. Uh, I'm experimenting with the idea that we're having dialogue when it comes to AI with four different things. We're having a dialogue with ourselves when we're generating prompts. So prompt engineering is actually forcing metacognition to be more explicit. So we're thinking about thinking as we're designing our prompts. But we're also having dialogue with selected human knowledge. What I mean by selected, this is knowledge that's in the data set and how it's been trained uh, to understand that data set. So that's selected in the sense according to the tool. We have dialogue with predictive texts in the sense that I can ask ChatGPT the same question at different times and it will generate different things based on how it predicts the text or, uh, based on a prompt. So I'm having a dialogue with possibilities. That's a very abstract way of thinking things. And then I'm having dialogue with systems within uh, whether it's a system within uh, the AI and information technologies or a system that has embedded it in to uh, the practice of an institution. So I've been experimenting a little bit with these concepts and one of the first things I experimented with was a design thinking based approach to an assessment where I was thinking well what would it be like to create a scene where I ask my students to create a language for a TV series. 
and I work myself through generating a whole entirely new language. Not a very good language, it's still not good at creating a new language, but it would be believable for a TV series. But go going through this process, I had to empathize with, say, my students' prior knowledge. What do they know about language, linguistics, its relationship with culture? How do we define the problem? What is it we're trying to do? Why are we trying to do this? Let's brainstorm now. What will this language look like? What cultural elements should we look in, at? What linguistic elements, such as morphology? So now the students need to start thinking about their prior knowledge in order to create this new language. Build a prototype, test it out, see how it works. Then iterate the process. So we have a design-based thinking process. AI is very useful as a tool to design this product in that way. So this is just a screenshot from my conversation where I asked it to uh, give me some morphological structures of this new language. And it was combining Chinese with English with uh, Germanic languages. Very interesting. We can use AI chatbots, going back to dialogical thinking, to, uh, the, the, the first three are by Ethan Mullock, which if you don't follow his blogs, I highly recommend that you do. We can use chatbots to generate an analogies, explanations, and arguments. Okay. And I think these are very useful ways of uh, entering into a dialogue with an AI chatbot. But we can also ask it to question things about our, our own knowledge about something. We can also ask it to create things for us to test our understanding of something for a specific purpose, like creating a new language. We can help solve problems, and we can also design prototypes through design thinking-based situations. So in this sense, if we have AI as in the role of a tutor or as a study buddy, the methods we use would be one of these methods. I'm going to use it to help me design something with my buddy, AI. So getting ready for this. Yes, we need to understand the ethics, and we also need to understand how AI is trained and validated. We need to understand the content policy of these tools, applications, and so on. But I also believe we need to understand the other areas, and these are how we move beyond just the uh, technical side of the tools, but also the contextual use of the tools in the different areas. How do we prepare teachers for this? Very quickly, we can use models, TPAC, technological, pedagogical content knowledge as one model, for example, to help teachers understand the use of these tools in different contexts. And I'll just run through what this might look like. So for example, if we want to take a look at faculty members' technological content knowledge, a teacher should understand how AI tools can be used to present, communicate, and enhance content knowledge in their specific areas, because the AI will handle it differently than other tools, for example. If we want them to look at technological pedagogical knowledge, teachers need to be aware of the pedagogical affordances, things it can do, and the challenges, the limitations of AI tools, such as how to use them for formative assessments, collaborative learning, or scaffolding students, their understandings, and so on. If we want to look at dialogical experiences, we can use the same model to guide us. Teachers should understand how generative AI tools can be used to enhance dialogical experiences with select human knowledge in their subject areas. They should be able to guide students in crafting prompts and interpreting AI-generated content to deepen their understanding of the subject matter. If we want to look at the technological, pedagogical knowledge of a teacher, they need to recognize the potential of the tools for fostering metacognition, for example, creativity, and critical thinking through various dialogical experiences. If we want to look at meta-intelligence in a TCK, in addition to understanding how AI tools can enhance content knowledge, teachers should be aware of how generative AI tools can foster meta-intelligence in their subject areas. For instance, they can use AI to analyze and reflect on students' contextual understanding cognitive processes and knowledge organization. If we look at it from the technological, pedagogical knowledge aspect, 
we can look at how the tools can guide students to explore the contextual awareness and knowledge organization as they engage with AI tools in the learning content. So this brings me back to context one, the future of work. And this is my final point. A lot of what I'm talking about, AI literacy, AI re readiness, is really preparing teachers to make the best decisions, both in which tools and AI tools to adopt, how they might um, use them in their curriculum design, in their teaching and learning design. But in the end, this is really to benefit the students to help them prepare for the future of work and to develop particular skills, not just in knowledge retention, but also in skills development, adaptability being one of them, problem solving being another. I'll leave this quote here from a colleague from the UK who says, AI detection software is in the future of education. AI empowered teaching and learning is. I think this is a powerful message. This should be one of our focuses, not chasing, but teaching and learning. Again, a lot of this is very speculative. This is still very new. We don't know what new tools will emerge in the next couple of years. I think Microsoft Copilot is an exciting tool that will be coming out. Right? I think that will have an impact. ChatGPT itself has already proven to be a very powerful tool and is having an impact. Um, hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll start to see more research emerge to show us what that impact is. Uh, but right now, what we need to do is rely on what we do know, and there's a rich resource of literature on educational research uh, related to teaching and learning, dialogic learning, uh, problem-based teaching and learning, design thinking-based learning. It's all there. And in fact, AI is just a tool that will probably enhance that learning experience with students. At the same time, we still need to be aware of the ethical implications data security, the bias, but in going through all of this we'll become a lot more AI ready and hopefully higher education will just become a better learning experience for teaching and learning. And that's all I have. Thank you.